Well, good evening. Um, I'm John Penalfino. I'm the president of the ANMS, and it's my pleasure to introduce you tonight to our webinar, the ANMS virtual webinar, uh, Medical Procedural Education Series on Pearls of Wisdom, focused on GI nuclear scintigraphy. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to remind everybody you saw the announcement. Um, we're having our annual meeting at the Fairmont in um, Austin, Texas. And remember, mark those dates, August 11th through 13th. Um, and also be prepared for our deadlines coming up pretty quickly for our grant deadlines of October 14th. And then, of course, the deadline for the mini sabbatical is December 1st, um, 2022. So it's really my honor tonight to, to introduce uh, the moderators. And I'll start with Jason Baker, who is a, a close friend and colleague over many years. I think everybody knows Jason for all the work he's done in terms of standardizing motility lab operation. He's been a crucial member of the ANMS, uh, serving on council and really participating in multiple uh, conferences. And then of course, a uh, person who needs no introduction, Henry Parkman, a tour de force in gastroparesis. Uh, currently he's the Stanley Lorber Chair in Gastroenterology at Temple, where he's been since 1990. Uh, what, what a sustained tenure at, at Temple. Um, he's also a, a member of the NIDK Gastroparesis Consortium and literally a world expert on everything gastroparesis. So I feel very comfortable handing over the symposium to my two moderators tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Panafina, for the kind introduction. Um, welcome, audience, to this exciting um, presentation series. Looking very forward to it and, and have an honor to share this moderating station with uh, Dr. Parkman, which has been a good friend for a very long time. So for people who want to put some questions, in, please put them in the Q&A, the little icon on the bottom of the screen, not the chat box. And Dr. Parkman and I will um, uh, work our way through each one of those questions and try to get all questions answered. Um, and, and Dr. Parkman will introduce our, our speaker for the evening. Thanks, Jason, and thanks, John. Uh, welcome, everybody, to this session on GI nuclear scintigraphy. Our speaker tonight is Dwayne Burton, and he certainly has made a uh, career in different pathways. He kind of has something for everybody out there. Uh, he came, he's been at Mayo Clinic for a long time, 43 years, came on as a GI assistant, then actually uh, became the manager of the GI diagnostic uh, procedure unit at St. Mary's, which is the hospital, uh, the primary hospital, at least it was uh, for Mayo Clinic. Then he went to the research world, and that's where I've gone uh, to know him through his publications. He's worked with Dr. Michael Camilleri. Well, that's a great name because he's done a lot in gastric emptying scintigraphy. And uh, Dwayne is probably his right-hand man because uh, I see him on all his papers. Usually Michael Camilleri is the uh, second author of the manuscripts. The first author is the uh, person who does it. And Dwayne is usually uh, a little bit later. But he's been um, doing a lot in GI um, uh, scintigraphy there with the gastric emptying test, the four-hour scintigraphy test with gastric accommodation test, as well as whole gut transit scintigraphy. He's still doing that now, but he's also progressed further. He's uh, now an assistant professor at Mayo Clinic. He's actually, his current role is a program manager supporting a variety of areas, not only the motility world, but also the Advanced Endoscopy Research Center. So we're very happy to have Dwayne Burton talk in the area of, of GI nuclear scintigraphy, someone that uh, does the tests and helps analyze the tests and actually uh, writes papers on the tests. Dwayne, thank you. Thank you very much. And I will uh, share my screen. So thank you, Dr. Parkman, for that introduction. And I want to thank Dr. Baker and Dr. Pandolfino and the AMS for the invitation to present today. It is my distinct honor to present to our gastrointestinal colleagues and others attending the today's symposium on GI nuclear scintigraphy. So to start off my presentation today, let's, let me review my learning objectives for you. First is uh, I'm going to define what scintigraphy is. Second, provide basic understanding of scintigraphy process. 
And third, to explain the scintigraphy methods for gastric emptying, uh, cold gut and clonic transit, and also to describe the method for measuring gastric accommodation in response to a meal. To start off with, scintigraphy is a nuclear medicine procedure generally performed within the radiology departments by nuclear medicine trained technicians or radiologists. It involves a combination of disciplines, including medical knowledge, chemistry, physics, mathematics, and computer technology. Scintigraphy is a procedure that utilizes a radioactive tracer to produce static or dynamic imaging allowed for visualization of an internal organ, as well as the organ function. Uh, to bring this into perspective, a static image uh, would be similar to taking a photograph where a dynamic imaging would be similar to video recording. Scintigraphy involves the administration of a radioactive tracer given intravenously or by ingestion or by intraperitoneal injection. It is one of the many tools in a battery of diagnostic physiologic tests available to medical providers to aid in determining the differential diagnosis for specific GI dysfunctions. In the March 2020 publication of the Journal of Nuclear Medicine, Dr. Maurer, Abel, and colleagues, with input from experts from nuclear medicine and gastroenterology, they published an appropriate use criteria guide in using GI scintigraphy in response to CMS requirements for appropriate use of diagnostic imaging. So to understand what a radioactive tracer is, is we first must start with some basic chemistry. Simply an atom of an element consists of protons, electrons, and neutrons with an equal number of each to maintain a neutral electrical charge. A radioisotope results when there is an imbalance of protons to neutrons in the atom's nucleus. As atoms work to obtain a stable state, the nucleus will release energy matter in the form of photons or otherwise referred to as gamma particles or gamma rays. These gamma particles are high energy with penetration power that easily passes through the human body. When given to patients at a low dose, radioisotopes that are gamma emitters provide the ability to visualize internal organs and organ function when these gamma rays are captured by a special radiologic receiving unit called a gamma camera. On the left here is a picture of a General Electric Infinia dual head gamma camera, which is located within our research laboratory here at Mayo and is, and is used for GI scintigraphy. The internal makeup of each detector head that you see here uh, consists of a collimator, which is a single plate of lead with holes aligned with lead tubules that, par that are parallel to each other a sodium iodide crystal and a, photo, and a series of photomultiplier tubes. When a gamma particle passes the collimator and travels through the tubes to reach the crystal, the crystal absorbs the energy and the gamma particle emits a flash of light that is proportional to the energy absorbed. This flash is then increased within the photo photomultiplier tubes with a series of dynodes or signal amplifiers, which then directs the electronic signal to a computer processor to produce an image. For GI scintigraphy, the most common collimators are low energy all-purpose collimators, low energy high resolution collimators, and medium energy collimators. The lower energy collimators have larger diameter holes, which increases the sensitivity, but has reduced image resolution because the increased scatter collected. Going up the spectrum with a medium, en medium energy collimator, the hole diameters are smaller and the tubules are deeper, allowing for a better capture and increased image resolution. The most common radioisotopes used in GI scintigraphy is technetium and indium. These are both gamma emitters, which are high energy and can enter or exit the human body easily. Given at low dose, typically indicated for gastrointestinal scintigraphy, the biologic effects from radiation exposure is minimal to the individual receiving the isotope. In this representation, um, the energy peaks for both isotopes are illustrated. Technetium is rep represented here in blue as the most common radioisotope used in GI scintigraphy because of its low energy and short half-life of six and a half hours. 
indium represented here in red is an isotope generally used for whole gut scintigraphy and clonic transit because of its longer half-life of 2.8 days, allowing for a visualization of the colon at 48 and up to 72 hours after dosing. For GI scintigraphy, the gamma camera is set to filter based on the energy spectrum of the isotope or isotopes being used. In our practice, the gamma camera processes are set to look at a 10% window either side of the isotope peak. Indium has two energy peaks and when assessing clonic transit and indium is used alone, the camera can be set up to look at both peaks. However, when clonic transit can also be performed in combination with technetium in whole gut scintigraphy with the same, with the gamma camera set to look at the technetium peak and then the second peak of indium. Of note, I wanna show that uh, the first peak of indium does fall within the technetium window. So when using both isotopes uh, during a scenographic scan and in the analysis of the technetium window, it would require uh, a calculation adjustment, uh, subtracting the pot potential of downscatter from the indium activity into the technetium window. As I have mentioned, technetium indium are, are most common isotopes used for GI scintigraphy, but the carriers of the isotope will vary based on the intended radiologic use. Technetium sulfur colloid is an excellent marker when used to label solid or liquid components of test meals for measurement of esophageal clearance and reflux, along with assessment of gastric and intestinal transit. Tech India Tech and indium DTPA or diethylene triamine pentaacetic acid, better referred to as DTPA, uh, can also be used as a liquid phase marker. When both solid and liquid gastric MD tests is performed, it re requires the use of two different isotopes to allow for accurate visualization of the different phases. Technetium is used to label the solid field, solid phase, and indium would be used to. Uh, label the liquid phase. Technetium pertechnotate is given IV and is taken up by salivary glands and gastric mucosa. Pertechnotate is cleared from, this, from a, the body system through the renal and urinary excretion system. Tech labeled red blood cells are used to identify intestinal bleeding sites and can be used to identify liver hemangiomas where tech uh, meprofenin or colotech uh, is used for imaging the liver, hepatobiliary system, and the gallbladder. And tech macroaggregated albumin uh, can be given intraperitoneally and is not absorbed and can be used uh, to assess peritoneal shunt uh, patency. And finally, indium chloride is uh, a radioisotope that uh, we use in bonding with activated charcoal uh, and used in measurement of clonic transit, which I will be uh, discussing here shortly. Here's a list of GI scintigraphic tests uh, available through many nuclear medicine departments to be used as diagnostic tools by the medical provider. For the remainder of my presentation today, I'll be focusing on GI transit studies and gastric accommodation assessment, which are highlighted here in the light blue. So let's get into how GI scintigraphy is performed, starting with gastric emptying. Here are some of the indications in which, in which a medical provider may order a gastric emptying test. So for indications of chronic nausea and vomiting, dyspepsia, early satiety, fullness and bloating, suspicion of gastroparesis, evaluation, uh, post-operative assessment, and of course, for research purposes. Gastric em emptying can also be assessed via different modalities, such as spirulina breath tests, wireless motility capsule, and scintigraphy. Each use may be dependent on the indication, the availability of the test itself, the cost associated with the test, and ultimately provider preferences. Each modality will provide useful information related to gastric emptying, but scintigraphy is, con is considered the gold standard. 
So gastric emptying starts with a preparation of a radio-labeled test meal. The recommended solid test meal is, that is endorsed by the ANMS and the Society of Nuclear Medicine is a low-fat egg beater meal that consists of four ounces of the egg beaters, two slices of white bread, 30 grams of jam, and 120 mils of water. Uh, all equates to about an, a caloric value of about 250 kcal. In the event of egg allergies, some centers may use alternate meal compositions such as radio labeled Ensure, cereal, or oatmeal. These alternate type meals would need to be validated to establish normal value ranges in comparison to the egg meal, but still can be used. The report validity when using alternate meal compositions would be at the discretion of the medical provider in the context of the patient's reported symptoms. In the event that patients have a gluten intolerance, the bread can be substituted with gluten-free bread. The pictures here represent two methods of planar imaging using a single and a dual head gamma camera. When using a single head, anterior and posterior scans are obtained independently whereas the dual head camera allows for the acquisition of both anterior scans to be done simultaneously. When liquid gastric emptying is ordered in combination of the solid phase, Indium DP, DTPA is added to the water and the gamma camera protocol is set up to measure both isotopes as previously described. This is a representation of the anticipated gastric emptying rates of liquids and solids in health and in gastroparesis. Gastric emptying curves uh, for these liquid and solid meals were derived based on a meta-analysis of data available in the literature. And as you can see, uh, water or 5% glucose uh, empties quite quickly as compared to the opposite spectrum where a high fat solid meal in the presence of gastroparesis empties significantly slower. So this is a represent, representation of acquired anterior gastric images using a color palette to better illustrate the distribution of counts within the image. At the time of the analysis, the technologist will draw a region of interest around the borders of the stomach at time zero, which is immediately obtained after the final bite of the radio label test meal. The computer then provides a numeric value of the activity within the ROI based on the number of intensity, based on the number and the intensity of the pixels. The zero man scan serves as the 100% reference from which the subsequent scans are measured. Additional ROIs are drawn around the stomach margin in the later scans with the activity counts provided. This same process is performed on posterior scans. I will draw attention to the value at the two hour or 120 minute scan. These counts being slightly higher than the previous scan represents a relative position of the radio labeled contents of the stomach being closer to the camera during the anterior imaging. These activity values are then used in an automated or manual process for calculating the radio labeled meal retention or the inverse, the proportion of the meal emptied from the stomach. This is an example of a spreadsheet with a manual input of the anterior and posterior ROI counts with the corrections uh, in the geometric uh, mean column for which is a correction for tissue attenuation and the correction for decay of the radioisotope based on the time that the scan was, get, uh, was obtained. I will again draw your attention to the 120 minute scan and notice that the inclusion of the posterior counts in the calculation combined with the activity corrected for tissue attenuation and decay provides a representative value of retention or emptying for that time point. The graphing of the proportion emptied for each time period provides a clear picture of the emptying rate for that test. Here's another example, but this is an automated gastric emptying report utilizing a commercial application from MIM software uh, from Cleveland, Ohio. During gastric emptying and, and at times, the patient may not be able to eat the entire test meal. When this occurs, discretion on whether to proceed with the testing is left to the medical provider requesting the test. 
when directed to proceed, the amount of the meal consumed is recorded and is a variable considered when interpreting the results of the test. In addition, there are occasions when a patient may vomit following ingestion of the test meal. When this occurs, the vomitus is considered a radioactive spill and must be cleaned according to radiation safety guidelines. The continued conduct of the test may be contingent upon the amount of the test meal lost. And again, continuance in the interpretation of the results would be at the discretion of the provider. So moving to whole gut and chronic transit, here are some indications for ordering these tests. They may be chronic unexplained diarrhea, constipation, abdominal pain and bloating, a suspected motility disorder, and, and once again, research. Clonic transit similar to gastric emptying can be assessed via different modalities, such as with the use of the ingestion of radioopaque markers, followed by abdominal x-rays taken the next day or days later, the wireless motility capsule and centigraphy. Again, the type of modality used can be dependent on the indication, availability, cost, and the provider preference, but since scintigraphy is still considered the gold standard. For whole gut transit studies, dual isotopes of technetium and indium are used. The method for which whole gut transit is conducted may be dependent on the medical center where the test is performed. At our institution, whole gut transit testing includes the same preparations of the test meal for gastric emptying, but also includes the preparation of an enteric capsule containing an immune chloride labeled activated charcoal and dextrose, which is used as a ballast to add weight to the capsule to prevent it from floating on the gastric contents. Once the capsule is prepared, it is then coated in a pH-sensitive methacrylate coating designed to dissolve within the distal small bowel and cecum when the intestinal milieu is near a neutral pH. As the capsule dissolves and the activated charcoal is released, the charcoal mixes and adheres to the colon contents, making it an excellent marker for assessing colonic transit. In other medical centers, colonic transit is measured with the use of radio-labeled liquid the radio labeled liquid phase of the test meal once it reaches the colon. <coughs> Excuse me. Our whole gut transit study involves unlabeled cal calibrated push meals to advance the radio labeled breakfast meal along the intestinal tract at uh, later times during the day. Scan times will vary in frequency, but generally includes frequent scans during the first four hour period to assess gastric emptying followed by scans at six, eight, and 24-hour images to assess small ball and clonic transit. Because of the length and convolutions of the small ball, small ball transit time is determined by assessing the amount of time it takes for a proportion of the labeled solid phase meal uh, at the time that it empties the stomach and an equal proportion of that meal when it reaches the ascending colon the differences would be considered the small ball transit time. An alternative method for assessing small ball transit is by determining the total amount of the test meal that has filled the colon at six hours after ingestion, which could be referred to as colonic filling at six hours. When the clonic test is ordered only Oh, excuse me, when only the clonic test is ordered, a single isotope of indium is used to assess colonic transit. So to measure um, clonic transit and how it is reported, it is reported as a geometric center. So the geometric center is a calculation based on the sum of each clonic segment proportion of the radio labeled meal multiplied by the weighted factor for that specific segment. So in this illustration, the, the weighted factor uh, for the ascending cecum and ascending colon would be a factor of one, transverse colon of a factor of two, descending colon factor three, rectal sigmoid of a factor of four, and anything that has left the body and would be um, captured in the stool would be a uh, weighted factor of five. So the proportion in each segment would be multiplied by these weighted factors and the sum of that would be uh, determine the geometric center. 
Here at the Mayo Clinic, our clonic transit analysis is performed by assessing the proportion of the radio labeled intestinal contents within the four segments of the colon and the stool. At other institutions, they may incorporate additional segmentations, of the, including the hepatic and splenic flexures. So rather than four segments, they may have six segments in addition to the stool for their analysis and geometric center determinations. Here's a representative of a clonic transit. Uh, for each scan, the proportion of each segment is multiplied again by its weighted factor, and the sum of the segment will provide the geometric center value. So um, illustrations to the left is an eight-hour scan with 89% in the ascending colon, 11% in the transverse colon. If you multiply each segment by its weighted factor, you, you do get that uh, geometric center value of 1.11. As compared to the 24-hour scan, uh, when you look at the proportions in each segment uh, and then multiplied by the weighted factor, um, you, the geometric center for this scan would be 2.75. And for those mathematic experts out there, if you were to add up each one of those segments, there is a total of 100% reference, so 100% of the activity, so there was no loss in the stool. So let's now move to how gastric accommodation is performed, but first here are some of the indications in which a medical provider uh, may order this test. Uh, indications uh, such as chronic nausea and vomiting, again, dyspepsia, early satiety and fullness, abdominal pain and bloating, suspicion of gastroparesis, rumination syndrome, and also uh, advancement in research. Historically, in some institutions and in some of the institutions today, the measurement of the stomach accommodation response to a meal is measured with the use of a gastric polyethylene balloon connected to a barostatic controlled unit. Tech protectinate given intravenously is easily taken up by gastric parietal and mucus cells within the lining of the stomach and has been used for years to identify ectopic gastric mucosa, such as Meckel's diverticulum. Uh, it, it, tech protectinate has also allowed testing using dynamic imaging to visualize gastric wall motion and contractions. And, had some, and advancements in computer technology allowing for three-dimensional imaging has led to the development of, of this non-invasive test to measure gastric accommodation and volume in response to a stimulus or a meal. So how is this performed? Uh, gastric accommodation via SPECT or single photon emission computed tomography is performed performed following the intravenous injection of technetium protectinate followed by approximately a 15 minute wait period to allow for the isotope to circulate through the system and for the uptake of the isotope by the mucus and acid producing cells within the lining of the stomach. The patient is then placed supine in, in the gamma camera with scans taken in a step sequence rotating around the patient. At our institution, our procedure involves scans taken every three degrees with five second acquisitions, completing 64 acquisition steps and a collection of 128 Im images to be processed. During the processing of the acquired image, pixel intensity thresholds are set and an edge detection algorithm is used to generate processing transactional images. This is a matrix representing a series of transaxial images beginning from the top of the stomach in the upper left-hand corner with slices moving caudally toward the bottom of the stomach viewed in the lower right corner. Of note is the donut-shaped image of the mid-body of the stomach is often seen during imaging following a meal with gastric contents being the center of the void in the image. The next step in the processing is the stacking of the array of transaxial images to create a three-dimensional rendered image and the calculation of stomach volume. Here's a representation of the fasting and thread fed 3D images with the volumes represented in the upper left-hand corner of the image. These images can be rotated to ensure the complete capture of the stomach 
And then the Fed image represents the accommodation response to a 300 mil uh, meal of insure. The total volume can include the insure meal, any naturally produced gastric contents, and the relaxation or accommodation phase in reaction to the meal. Since technetium pertechnetate is excreted through the kidneys and urinary system, it is really important to rotate the image to ensure that part or all of the kidney is not captured and included within the calculation of the gastric volume. So to end, uh, centrigraphy continues to advance our GI science. Uh, these are just some examples of the current uh, developments of uh, using GI scintigraphy, looking at gastric emptying uh, and the role of meal distribution within the stomach and its association with GI symptoms. Pet imaging of the brain in response to GI symptoms, excuse me. And pet imaging to identify areas of intestinal inflammation. Uh, for those who are involved in, in billing of scintigraphy, I'm, I've provided here some of the CPT uh, billing codes for scintigraphy. With that, I want to thank you for this opportunity to present, and we'll turn it back uh, to our moderators for questions and answers. Thank you very much, Duane. That was fabulous. And I learned quite a bit that I did not know. I was really looking forward to this presentation. Um, we're starting to get a lot of questions in the Q&A box, um, but I, I'll start out with the first one and then uh, toggle back and forth between myself and Dr. Parkman. Um, I thought it interesting, you know, with the different type of, of scans, one people standing up, one laying down, how about the different levels of BMI? How would that impact like the, the technician or the, uh, the person helping perform the test? Is there different protocols for people with you know different levels of BMI when they do a scan? I, I'll take that. Um, when we um, perform the procedure, uh, the heads of the gamma camera are brought in close proximity to the body. Uh, to get as close to the stomach as possible. Um, in the calculations with the anterior and posterior imaging, uh, the tissue attenuation and specifically related to BMI, the thickness of the body, that uh, geometric mean provides a correction factor for the thickness of the individual. And so when um, the series of scans that are being acquired, that tissue attenuation stays consistent and we're able to accurately uh, model the gastric emptying rates associated with that. All right, thank you. Dr. Parkman, you wanna do yeah, the next hey, question? Uh, Jason, uh, let me just emphasize a couple of the key points that, that I think that Dwayne was trying to uh, emulate. Uh, one is the gastric emptying uh, test is used with a solid meal. It's used, um, a four hour test is, is usually done. And uh, patients sometimes ask me, why do you have to stay there for four hours? I like to think of it as at four hours, the, the standard error of the normal value is very small. At two hours, it's large. So sometimes with the shorter tests, the 90 minute or two hours, it's hard to tell if someone really has delayed gastric emptying. And you can really tell that with the four hour test. Plus at four hours, that's when you're supposed to eat your next meal. So it nice, it's nice to uh, explain to the patient, hey, you're eating your meal when you still got uh, a quarter or 50% of the meal still in your stomach. No wonder you're full or no wonder you have uh, nausea. And also um, Dwayne nicely um, put together the, a standardized test. The nice thing about having different centers using the same protocol is you can compare the results among different centers. It's sometimes hard when we see a patient clinically, if they've had the oatmeal two hour test and we do the egg beater four hour test, you kind of sometimes can't really compare them. So that's just a plea to uh, have people use a standardized test that measures gastric emptying to four hours. 
Hey, uh, Dwayne, one thing that the patients sometimes tell me, two things related to their symptoms. One is, should they wait till they become symptomatic? You know, sometimes you're seeing them and they're not that symptomatic. Should, should we wait till they have severe symptoms? That's one question. And the second one is, they sometimes tell me, well, the meal didn't generate any symptoms. I don't, I don't uh, consider that a fair test. How do you how do you answer that? Well, um, the centigree at the time is just the snapshot in time uh, at the time of the transit being performed. So the medical provider needs to uh, use uh, the centigree as just one tool in their toolbox to to come up with a differential diagnosis and to figure out a treatment. Uh, for that particular individual. Now, you mainly mentioned about, um, Duane, about um, gastroparesis. Uh, actually, uh, one of the uh, articles I quote uh, is an article done uh, probably by you, but also Dr. Camilleri about in functional dyspepsia. Uh, let's see, I think a third have slow, a third have rapid emptying, and actually a third have impaired accommodation. How do you assess for, in, in your studies, for rapid gastric emptying? It's, it's a measure of using the same uh, test and uh, looking at the gastric emptying rate uh, based over the period of time. So uh, if they are rapid, they are probably emptying the stomach uh, in less than um, in an area of two to three hours a time. Gastroparesis may be in excess of four hours a time and the normal rate uh, somewhere between three and the four hours. Um, I, I believe the current uh, standard for assessment of gastroparesis is a uh, retention of greater than 25% of the meal at the four hour time point. Yeah, um, at, at, at our, if I can just add to what we do at our center, um, uh, we use the, uh, we get the images, the key images we, we get are the ones right after the meal at one, two and four hours. We use the two and four hours to primarily look for delayed gastric emptying, but the one hour mark uh, we use for uh, rapid emptying. And if there's less than 30% uh, retained in the stomach at the one hour mark, we generally um, label that as um, rapid gastric emptying. Yeah. One mm -hmm. measure um, of assessment of gastric emptying that I did not include in my presentation um, is, is an assessment of the gastric emptying time at half empty. So, uh, GET 50. So that provides us a, yet another uh, parameter in which to assess the speed in which the stomach is emptying. The, we know at what point 50% uh, of the meal has emptied uh, from the stomach and in comparison uh, across the spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, what... Uh, what do you do for the colon transit? How do you know the, uh, the stool actually got out? Or do you measure anything with the stool that's, that the patient puts out during the, what is it, 48-hour test or 72-hour test? Uh, good question. Uh, way back when, uh, the early days of doing scintigraphy, we did uh, collect stool and did uh, measurements of the radioactivity uh, within the stool, but that was not a positive uh, procedure with technicians and technologists. And, and patients. And, and, and patients, yeah, exactly. So um, with the fact that when we are doing clonic transit and we do the earlier scans, we're able to determine what is the 100% activity um, at that time. And then as we draw our region of interest and determine the proportions of each segment uh, compared to the 100% activity, whatever may not add up to 100%, we are, are assuming has been lost in the stool and is included in the calculation. 
Okay, that's great for some of the people out there to know that through good math, they don't have to collect the stool samples from the patient. Yep. Um, hey, can uh, you comment a little bit about liquid phase gastric emptying? Uh, uh, like what, 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 uh, what, what sort of situation would you try to get that? And um, uh, what, what sort of, uh, how do you measure liquid emptying? What sort of constituents do you use? Well, when we uh, do liquid emptying, uh, we're, we use uh, either uh, radio-labeled milk or radio-labeled water used in DTPA. And that may be used in the presence of, uh, you know, some other dyspepsia to, to determine the differences between uh, liquid emptying rates and the solid emptying rates. Hey, hey Dwayne, um, hey, and Stephanie, uh, we have a question about Dwayne's uh, billing code um, slide. Can we put that on AMS's Twitter page and, and send that out to everybody um, uh, for uh, further review or a snapshot they can take back to their local institution? And Dwayne, we only got about uh, about two and a half minutes left. So I just wanted to ask you if people were you know, attending this webinar or gonna watch it on YouTube in the future, what, what pearls of wisdom would you give them as you know someone like yourself that's just starting this career that's interested in this to uh, expand it at their institution or just expand their knowledge to become you know the next Dwayne Burton? Uh, that's a loaded question. Uh, uh, um, I, I can tell you the GI science uh, from when I started 41 years ago uh, in GI to what it is now. Uh, and the current advancements of the technology. Uh, and, and I have the privilege of working with uh, Dr. Michael Camilleri, and, who is often on the cutting edge of uh, new initiatives to try to figure out GI disease and GI dysfunction. So, um, you know, it's an exciting field. It's an ever-changing field, uh, you know, if it wasn't, I probably wouldn't have stayed within uh, the GI department for 41 years. All right. Well, I, you know, the com we, we, if we don't, haven't got to all the questions, um, we'll continue the conversation on Doc Matters. And then also the questions will be circulated through Dr. Parkman and Dwayne and myself to provide some answers. I'd like to thank Dr. Parkman for co moderating today and great job, Dwayne Burton, for. Uh, for presenting to us and something part a lot more people need to learn more about and thank you for all people attending the session tonight we hope you have a great night thank, thank you, you. Dwayne. very nice talk thank you dr parkman goodbye